Thank you, young ladies. What a blessing. Amen. I'm telling you, that was a real blessing. Did a terrific job. And uh, singing the Christmas songs and coming into our church and seeing it decorated, it puts you in that spirit, does it not? That Christ has been born. And that he is the savior of the world. We certainly want to thank Miss Boots and all the ladies that helped in decorating our church. And uh, we are grateful for that. I know it takes a lot of work, but I appreciate that. Take your Bibles. Yes, let's give them a hand. Let's give them a hand. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 3, as we're continuing our study and our journey through 1 Peter. And uh, next Sunday and next couple of Sundays, we're going to take a break from First Peter and begin focusing upon the Christmas story. But today, we're going to look at some very unusual passage of scriptures, passage of scriptures that maybe that has been very hard to understand and hard to interpret, and we're going to look at this. Everybody knows about the, cruc the crucifixion. I mean, as we talk about uh, coming into the house of the Lord, we've talked about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, Easter, that blessed, glorious day, we talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Two mighty events that the church of today is very familiar with. But what about those three days and three nights in between the crucifixion and the resurrection? What happened? What took place when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, Peter addresses that today. And so we're going to look at that. Uh, did Jesus, uh, when he died upon the cross and they buried him in a tomb, did he, he just go through that what some call soul sleep? Did he just sleep away those three, three days and three nights? What did he do? What happened during that time? Well, he shed some light here. And we're going to look at this with verse 18 of chapter 3. And we're going to read through verse 22. So would you stand with me in reverence of reading God's word? Let's read this. And let's allow Peter share with us some events that maybe that we're not familiar with. He says, for Christ also suffered once for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now, of course, he's talking about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ there, that Christ died upon the cross. That sinless one became the substitute for mankind. But then notice what else he says. He says, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities 
and powers having been made subject to him. What in the world is he talking about? Well, we're going to find out. And I think you're going to be amazed and be excited to see the power of God working. Even in the midst of those three days, in between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Father, in Jesus' name, we've come together today. And we're excited about the scripture that is before us today. Now, Lord, we know that through our own means, we cannot understand the Scripture the way that it should be understood. So we need the help of the Holy Spirit that he might allow us to be enlightened of the mighty work that Christ demonstrated there between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Help us, dear Lord, that we might grow in your grace and in in maturity in your love. And so, Father, thank you now for blessing us. Fill us with your spirit. Anoint us that we might be able to preach your word as well as to receive your word for the honor and for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our prayer today. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you. May be seated. We're going to dive into this passage of Scripture. It's probably one of the hardest passages of Scriptures throughout the New Testament to understand. I went back and I discovered since the very first century, there have been 90 different great theologians have ciphered and exegeted this passage of Scripture, and they all were different from one another. I went back and I looked at some of the commentaries that I have. Great, great commentaries. And it seems like many of them differ from one from the other. And so I had to ask myself the question, well, what does the Scriptures teaching us? See, I believe that in order to, to understand the Scripture, that you read the Scripture and that the Scripture will explain itself. And that's what I want us to do. I'm reminded, of course, of what Martin Luther said about this passage of Scripture. This is what he said. He said, this is a, a strange text and certainly a more obscure passage than any other passage in the New Testament. Yes, it is a strange passage of Scripture, but we're going to dive into it, and by the help of the Holy Spirit, we're going to discover, I believe, some wonderful truths of the work of Christ in between the crucifixion and the resurrection. First of all, you go back and look at verse 18. As I've already pointed out, he is talking about the cross. Now, one of the things that you'll discover through this passage of Scripture, that Jesus is the conqueror. He is the one that had won the battle. And he is sharing with us today of how he won that battle. He won the battle at the cross. He won the battle between uh, the, the cross and the resurrection, and he won the battle as well as the resurrection and the ascension. So, friend, if you know Jesus Christ, you're on the winning side. Amen. And isn't that exciting? <laughs> and I don't know of anything that should prepare us and help us to be prepared for the Christmas season than to understand that very thing. Let's look at verse 18 for a moment as we think about he conquered the cross. He conquered the cross. The Bible says in the opening statement in verse 18, he said, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. 
a clear reference to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why did he go to the cross? Well, the Bible reminds us immediately that man is sinful, that we are born as a sinner. We are by nature a sinner, and that therefore sin had to be dealt with. Man, no way is righteous. There's only been one that is righteous, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only been one that is just, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Every single one of us are what is known as unjust and as sinners. My friend, I want you to understand whether I don't care how well you live, I don't care how honest you are, I don't care whether you pay your taxes and your tithes and all those kinds of things. My friend, you're a sinner. I am a sinner. I mean, friend, all you've got to do is look around and investigate and to begin to see of the times of mistakes in your life. It didn't take me very long when I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ to come and make that confession that I am lost because of my sins. I am a sinner. And there's one that is known as Jesus Christ as the one that had never sinned. And that he was above sin. And so therefore we see that he has come to save man from his sins. The responsibility of God is to remind us that we are sinners. That's what the Holy Spirit of God does in the life of an individual. When God confronts him with salvation, the very first thing he does, he confronts him with the bad news. And the bad news is that you're lost. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so therefore... That's why some people don't want to admit that they're sinners. Some people don't want to say, well, I believe I'm a sinner, but uh, uh, I'm not going to do anything about it. A lot of people just go to the point of saying, I'm a good person. I'm a good husband. I'm a good father. I'm a good citizen. I'm a good neighbor. I'm, I'm this. I'm this. I'm this. Now, all that might be true. But my friend, the Bible says that we are sinners. Now, we got a problem here. If we're sinners and God is holy, which he is, what do we do with the sin? Does he just overlook sin? Does he wink at sin? By his own character, he has to judge sin. That's why when you come to a point and a plan, a, a, a time where a man is approaching this thing called death, you become very serious about looking at your life. Because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and then comes judgment. I mean, you stop and you think about it. You, you take your little children. Take a little baby, as innocent and pure as a little baby. You don't have to teach that little baby to do wrong. You have to teach him to do what's right. right. It comes natural to do wrong. You mean to tell me that little baby is a sinner? Absolutely. As he gets older, he will lie to you. He will do things that you would have never imagined. Why? Because... He is a sinner. He's born as a sinner. The Bible says in Psalms 51 verse 5 that you were conceived in iniquity. You've been brought forth in iniquity. And so a child does just what's natural, and that is that he is a sinner. God is holy. You say, now wait a minute, God is love. Well, you're exactly right. But my friend, the greatest attribute of God is not that he is love, but that he is holy. 
He is holy. And by his holiness demands that sin must be prosecuted. Because if not, he would cease from being holy. And so it seems like we've got a dilemma there. If you really want to know the greatest picture of the love of God, it is found in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Listen to what the scripture says. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet, what? Sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, God is love. And I prove to you that he is love. He exercised his holiness by sending his son into this world that he might become a substitute for you and for me that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That we might become righteous. Who can imagine? Who can understand? Man, a sinner. Man, lost. Man, wretched. Man, unjust. Becomes righteous. It's beyond my comprehension. But that's the amazing power and work that God does at salvation. That he takes a man that is wretched and he makes him just. He takes a man that is lost and he makes him alive. He takes a man that comes and becomes like the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, man is a sinner. But the master is the Savior. The Bible says there in verse 18, it uses this word once. For Christ also hath once suffered his sins, or suffered for sins. Now, that word once does not mean once upon a time. That's not what he's talking about. But literally what he's talking about, once and for all. One time he suffered. One time he paid the penalty. One time he gave what needed to be accomplished upon the work of Of the cross. You remember the last words of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross? It is finished. It is finished. What does it mean? That he was finished? Absolutely not. His work was just beginning. But my friend, what it literally means, no more law. What it literally means, no more works. No more sacrifices, no more slaying of the lambs, no more holy of holies, no more of those things. That it is finished, that the final work of God has come to a completion there upon the cross. It is finished. Some people said, well, really what happened was Jesus made a down payment for our sins and that we make installment payments as we grow in the Lord, that we, that we live good, we go to church, we be baptized, we do all these kinds of things, and we're making installments toward our salvation. Nothing could be further from the truth, my friend. But when Christ paid the price upon the cross, it, it, it was finished and nothing else can be added or taken away. 
I want to give you a passage of Scripture. I want you to see what the writer of Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25 and 26. It says, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest, entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. But then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Once put away the sins. And therefore, my friend, the object of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ was to bring you and me to a relationship, to a holy God. That God so loved us that he sent his son that he could have a relationship with you, an intimate relationship, a relationship where he walks with you and talks with you, a relationship where he will never leave you or forsake you, a relationship that he will be with you forever and ever and ever. That's the kind of relationship he wanted to have with you. Some people say, well, you know, there's many ways to God. It's just like going to the airport, and there's many different flights that will take you to New York. You just determine which flight you want to take. They all those flights that go to New York, they may go in different directions, but eventually they'll get to New York. My friend, you don't understand what the scripture teaches us. All religions are not the same except one. When I think about only one, the Lord Jesus Christ, I think about all these religions will send you to straight hell. But here, as I begin to look at the passage of Scripture, it's not my morality that will send me to heaven. It's not my goodness that will send me to heaven. It's not what I think. It's not what you think. It's what the Word of God says, Amen. that Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no man can come unto the Father except by me. Only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. Amen. You try it any other way, my friend, you'll miss it. But Jesus says, I am the way. I was reading a story not too long ago. I love to read about D.L. Moody. What a great, great man of God he D.L. Moody was preaching at this place, and when he preached, crowds came from everywhere. And sometimes when he preached that the crowds were so large, they had to give out tickets in order to be able to accommodate the people in the uh, auditorium. D.L. Moody walked out of a room, and there stood a little boy little boy had heard a lot about D.L. Moody. He didn't know D.L. Moody, but he'd heard a lot about him. And the little boy was crying. And D.L. Moody said, son, why are you crying? He said, I want to see and hear Mr. Moody. And I don't have a ticket. And they tell me that I can't get, get in there without a ticket. Well, back then... Preachers wore these suits that had long tails. And so D.L. Moody looked at the little boy and kind of grinned. He said, I'll tell you what you do, son. You see that coattail? You grab a hold of it. And when I walk through that door, you hang on as tight as you can. And he said, I'll get you in there. And about that time, the doors opened. Here walked D.L. Moody into that auditorium. And there was that little boy holding on those coattails as tight as he could. And the ushers looked at him, 
And he said, welcome, son, come on in. When I read that story, I thought, you know what? I'm so glad I've got a hold of the Lord Jesus Christ's Amen. coattail. And through his coattail, I have been welcomed into the family of God Amen. and into the kingdom. No other way. Amen. No other way. So he talked about the crucifixion here and how important that event took place. But let's go a step further. Let's look at verse 19 just for a second. He not only conquered the cross, but he conquered the grave. The Bible says there in verse 19, listen to what it says. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. When Jesus died on the cross... They took his body off that cross and they put him in a barred tomb and for three days and three nights Jesus' body was within that tomb. What happened during that time? Did he just, his body just lay there? His spirit just lay there? Well, the Bible tells us here, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. First of all, I want you to notice that this does not teach that you have a second chance after you die. It does not mean you can get saved after you have died. Friend, if you're not saved before you die... You're not going to be saved after you died. Amen. The doctrine of the second chance, there's no such thing. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it's been appointed unto man once to die, and then comes judgment. Comes judgment. See, you're going to die at least one time. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to die twice. You will die physically and you will die spiritually. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been born twice. You've been born physically and you've been born spiritually, but you'll only die once, physically. And the Bible says that you will then face Judgment. In other words, when one dies, whether you're lost or whether you're saved, you're going to face judgment. If you're lost and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to face the judgment why you rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have to give an account of why you rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And friend, I want you to notice the sentencing of that rejection is, is eternal hell. But if you're saved, you will also face a judgment. Oh, you won't face the judgment of hell or of that nature, but you will be faced with the judgment of service. There will be a time where you will stand at the judgment seat of Christ and there you will stand and give an account for what you did in this body, in this life while you were a Christian. You will give account of your faithfulness or your unfaithfulness. So, but there will be a judgment. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chain of darkness to be reserved for judgment. 
See, friend, this passage of Scripture is not teaching as Jesus went down and evangelized those angels. He didn't go down to evangelize those angels because they're mortal beings. They're eternal. They cannot be saved or lost. So he did not do that. This passage of Scripture is teaching us two things. First of all, whom is the Lord preaching to during this time? And not only whom is he preaching to, but also what is he preaching? Back at the beginning of time, there were angels, corrupted angels, that God cast out of heaven. And because of their demonic spirits, he cast them into hell. And they have been chained there ever since. And so when Jesus died, and between the crucifixion, and between the resurrection. His spirit, with the help of the Holy Spirit, went down into the chambers of that eternal hell. And he preached and he proclaimed the word to these demons. Now, what did he preach? What did he preach? i tell you exactly what he preached. And I believe it with all my heart. He preached victory. See, what happened was life and death was confronted in a battle. And life conquered death. And so what Jesus proclaimed, as the Bible talks about proclamation, it says it does One of two things. It evangelizes or it's a herald or it's an announcement of something. Jesus gave the announcement, I won. The victory has been taken place. I have conquered death. I have conquered hell. I have conquered the grave. And not a one could reject that. Aren't you so glad to know that even between the cross and the resurrection, Jesus is still active and that he is proclaiming the victory? Listen to Jude chapter 6, I mean verse 6. I think this uh, sums it up, chapter 1 verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, He had reserved an everlasting change unto darkness for the judgment of the great day. So it proves that who was there and what was being demonstrated. He made the announcement of victory. He proclaimed victory. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says, When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2 verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every knee, even the demons of hell, will bow before the Lord Jesus Christ and will announce and will recognize and will salute him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords because of his conquering power. He conquered the grave. And therefore, my friend, when he went down into the very pits of hell, he came forth with the keys of victory, the Bible proclaims. I have overcome this world and overcome sin and overcome the devil and overcome the grave, overcome death. Whatever your enemy is, my friend, I want you to know Jesus Christ is the conqueror. 
and he has conquered those enemies. And I am so grateful and thankful to know that I'm on the winning side. Amen. That teaches me that I don't, I don't fight for victory. I fight from victory. The victory's already been won. Amen. And so therefore, and then you'll notice the manner of salvation. The Bible says in verse 20, who formerly were disobedient, when once divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. Many of our friends from other denominations says, Aha, that proves it right there that you're saved by baptism. My friend, that's not what the Scripture's teaching. You've got to read the whole context of the Scripture there, not just take part of that verse out of its context. Very plain that Peter is using an illustration, two types of illustration of baptism. Baptism does not save you. I want you to understand that. You can be baptized in every lake and every tadpole in the world can know your social security number and still die and go to hell. <laughs> Friend, baptism will not save you. It's important. Baptism that Peter makes reference to of two things. He makes reference to Noah and the ark. See, the water did the water was a symbol of judgment. The ark was a symbol of Jesus Christ. And you were saved from the judgment, the wrath of God. And then, of course, the resurrection is one of the best pictures of what baptism means. That as you enter into that water, that water is a picture of a grave. And as you enter into that water, you're saying, I identify with the death of Christ. He died for me personally. And then when they take you, as the pastor takes you and lowers you underneath that water, you're saying, I now identify with his burial. I am buried with Christ. My sins have been buried in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought before me again. And then, praise God, you come up out of that water, and it's a picture of resurrection. Picture of resurrection, a picture of new life, a picture that life that Christ has given to you. And so, therefore, every time you see a person being baptized, you have just received the message of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a beautiful picture, a beautiful picture that is here. Now, there's a lot of people have wrestled with this thing about baptism. A lot of times when they're children, they'll get baptized. And then later on, they realize they didn't understand what they were doing. And they get saved. Well, now, do they need to be rebaptized? Absolutely. Absolutely. Baptism needs to be on the proper side of your salvation because it's a symbol. If it's beforehand, it doesn't speak anything. That's why there's been a lot of people who've walked down the aisles or have talked with me and says, Pastor, I want a clear conscience. And that's what the Bible talks about here, having a clear conscience. A clear conscience is, is that I want to be right with God. One of the very first commands that God gives to a, a new believer is to be baptized in his likeness. Right. And if you were baptized before your salvation, it had no 
proper view of salvation. But after where you need to be baptized. Some of you here talking to me, I mean, as I'm talking to you right now, some of you need to be rebaptized because your baptism was on the wrong side of your salvation. And then there's some that has accepted the Lord that's never been baptized. How can you expect God to bless you? How can you expect for you to walk in the likeness of God? How can you expect to walk into the fellowship of God? And you rebel against the very first commandment of God in your life after salvation. You need to get baptized and have a clear conscience. The Bible says that Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall not be ashamed. You say, Pastor, I'm afraid of water. Pastor, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to stand before people. I don't want to do this. Jesus died on a cross before all mankind. The least he asks of you is to be baptized before your family and for your friends. I encourage you to do that. But one last thing, and we're going to close. I want you to notice, he not only conquered the cross, he not only conquered the grave, but friend, he conquered through the clouds. Listen to what the Bible says in verse 22. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him he's talking about the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ on that great glorious day as he ascended up into the sky back into the heavens now you do you are reminded that Satan is the prince of the air and if Satan could he would have stopped the Lord Jesus Christ going back to heaven. But oh no, my friend, Jesus held the keys of victory. And the victory as he went up, 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 up away, up into the skies of heaven. He was pronouncing victory. Oh, how glorious it was. He conquered the clouds. No longer in a tomb. No longer in the corridors of hell. Up from the grave he arose. Living he loved me. Dying he saved me. Buried he carried on sins far away. Rising he justified. Freely, forever. One day he's coming again. Oh, glorious, glorious day will that be. Amen. Amen. Glory to the honor of God. We have, are serving a conquering Christ. He conquered the enemy. He conquered sin. He conquered the grave. He conquered death. He conquered the clouds. He conquered hell. And therefore, friend, that's why we can come and celebrate this Christmas season that he is the Savior. To God be the glory. For the great things he does. My, 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 my. I'm ready for him to come today. Amen? (laughs) Absolutely. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a joy. What a delight. Reading about the amazing working power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, dear Father, for allowing us to be a part of that victory. And to enjoy that victory in our life today. Lord, I believe I'm talking to people today that have never really came, have come to the point and place in their life of realizing that they're a sinner 
But today, through the scriptures and through the preaching of your word, they have been convicted that they're sinners by choice, by nature. And they realize Jesus is the substitute upon the cross. And there on the cross, he paid the penalty for sin. Thank you, Jesus. And there I come confessing my sins and believing in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I confess you and accept you would be my prayer this morning. There are some people here today, dear Lord, not only would need to receive you, but Lord, there's some that needs to come and be baptized. Oh, maybe as a child they were baptized and later on they were saved. And their baptism is on the wrong side of their salvation. And with a clear conscience, they come now wanting to obey your word and fulfill your word. There's some, dear Lord, that has never been baptized. And Lord, you tell us that one of the very first commandments of God in a believer's heart is to go and to be baptized in the likeness of Jesus Christ. So now, Lord, may the work of the Holy Spirit demonstrate His power and His conviction. Others may need to come unite with this church. Whatever the Lord asks you to do, I invite you to do it, encourage you to do it. In the name of Jesus, we pray.